Sean, when you look for hidden heart disease and people like you and me going to work, riding your bike, going for walks, jogging, all that stuff, but no symptoms. When you look for hidden early heart disease, you see it everywhere. It's everywhere. The dietary guidelines are tragically wrong. They're set up based on flawed science, misinterpretations, and profit-making by big agribusiness. If you had a kitchen sink full of greasy dishes and you put a drop of dishwashing liquid, you see the oil disperse immediately. Mm. That's what those emulsifying agents do to your mucus barrier. The diabetes goes away. The coronary disease risk goes away. The psoriasis, depression <laughs> goes away just by addressing. Now it's based on three things we're correcting. Growth Minds. Whether it's your first time here or you've been here before, I'm curious to know what it is that brought you here. And if you can, smash that like button below. It really helps spread our message to more people. All right, on to the episode. <clears throat> you know, I, I don't hear stories often of a cardiologist uh, all of a sudden deciding to specialize and become an expert in gut health and microbiomes. It, you know, what's kind of the behind the stories there of how you decided to make this first pivot in your career, or maybe it was the second, I'm not sure. Well, it's, it's a long story, but it, so I was practicing and I, I trained for a long time, 17 years of education training to do angioplasty and implant stents, abort heart attacks, do atherectomies, uh, eczema laser angioplasty, all the high technology things. In fact, I was brought from Cleveland to Milwaukee 26 years ago <laughs> to help set up the new technologies in some of the hospitals. They were kind of behind the times. And so they brought me in to bring in the, all the new technologies. Nine months into my move to Milwaukee, I got a call that my mom had died of sudden cardiac death after her successful, successful, Sean, two vessel coronary angioplasty. So here I am doing these procedures and my mom in New Jersey, I was, I'm in Milwaukee. She was in New Jersey where I grew up. My mom dies of the disease that I thought I managed effectively in a cath lab every day. So it was a kick upside the head Sean, that trying to manage this very difficult disease in a procedure room is kind of silly. You get people in the midst of a crisis, perhaps, but what could have what we have done, say, to identify the potential that my mom was going to die of heart disease two years earlier, five years, whatever. Well, back then, the only device, and this is, remains true today, was a CT heart scan that generates something called a coronary calcium score based on a very simple principle developed by my friend, Dr. John Rumberg, when he was at Mayo. And he showed that calcium occupies 20% of total atherosclerotic plaque volume. So you can use it as a dipstick for the amount of plaque you have. Well, I, I put the other, the people in funding, and we brought the first heart scan device to Wisconsin, one of the first in the Midwest, 26 years, or 23 years ago, something like that. We start scanning people left and right. Sean, when you look for hidden heart disease and people like you and me, going to work, riding your bike, going for walks, jogging, all that stuff, but no symptoms. When you look for hidden early heart disease, you see it everywhere, it's everywhere. So normal score is zero, no atherosclerotic plaque, no calcium to score it. But we're scanning people, everyday people, you and me, scores of 300, 500,000, terrible scores. Well, back then, this is many years ago, uh, we put people on as baby aspirin, a statin cholesterol drug at high dose, a low fat, low saturated fat diet, right? Exercise program. We help publish these data. If you do nothing, those scores go up 25% per year. If you go on at baby aspirin, statin, cholesterol drug, low fat diet, extra, it goes up 25% per year. Has no, no impact effect wow. at all. Right. Well, what do people do? They're panicking, right? They're freaking out. They say, what do we do? Well, some of my colleagues, of course, they love this because they use people who are frightened and persuade them to have procedures. It's wrong. It's actually malpractice, but it's done every day. Every day, Sean, every day. People put through heart catheterization, 
uh, preventive stent implantation or bypass surgery. So it's, well, I, I, I knew that was absolutely wrong. I wanted better answers, but there were no answers. Even the experts, the experts actually said that, Sean, if you can't stop progression of the score, don't repeat the scan. Just let them have their heart attacks or symptoms and deal with it then, which wow. is a really awful answer. So I set about looking for strategy. It took me some years, a lot of zigzagging, dead ends, and you know uh, things that didn't work. But it led me to some really enlightening observations. For instance, when you add vitamin D to the mix, it was the first time I saw these scores drop. Not just stop progressing, but actually drop. But the other thing I did was, it was clear that this idea of reducing cholesterol is a ridiculous idea. It's outdated. No, it should have been rejected decades ago, but it's been kept alive by the pharmaceutical industry who profits from this false notion that cholesterol causes heart disease. Because they're cholesterol selling cholesterol a, drugs. Yes. Uh huh. Right. Cholesterol is a component of the particles in the bloodstream, the lipoproteins, the fat carrying proteins. It's a component of those particles that cause heart disease. Well, you know, you can measure those lipoproteins. You'll see right away that the driving force, and this is not my data, there's, there's other people's data, like Ron Krauss from UC, Ber University of California, Berkeley, Hopkins, people have published a lot of data on this, University of Toronto. There's a wealth of data to show us that high cholesterol is not the cause. Among the causes is an excess of small LDL particles, uh, for which cholesterol is an indirect and crude marker. So we can actually mm. measure the particles. And so these people have really high levels, 1,800, 2,000, 2,400 nanomoles per liter, particle count per volume. And it was clear back then, even 20 years ago, the only foods, the only dietary causes of that uh, particle, not saturated fat, not total fat, wheat, grains, and sugars, period. Uh, and so we, I had people take wheat, grains, and sugars out of the diet, and they did it. Small LDL particle drop from maybe 1973 to zero, or some other very low number. I was, it was, it was striking how effective this was. Mm -hmm. But it's when people came back and said, "Yeah, okay, my small LDL is great now. Maybe my coronary calcium score dropped by thirty percent, and I feel great." But you didn't tell me I would lose seventy three pounds. You know, in the U.S., people are massively obese, so they they have room to lose seventy three pounds. Not so much where you are. <laughs> And they say things like, my rheumatoid arthritis is almost gone. My psoriasis is so much better. My type 2 diabetes is gone. I'm off the insulin and three drugs. And my blood pressure is so much better. I had to stop three blood pressure. And so, Sean, just for the purposes of coronary calcium scores and small LDL particles, I stumbled into a lifestyle that exposed all the advice being given by the U.S. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services, USDA, Dietitians and my colleagues look to be completely and utterly and tragically wrong. And there's been no looking back since then. I've watched other people do this. I've watched, I don't know, we're into millions now, but hundreds of thousands of people who've done this with extraordinary results. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, is it that you're mostly focusing on things that you can do to prevent these uh, emergency cases? Whereas the pharmaceutical industry and the, the kind of the way it's been done 26 years ago is you're kind of really just relying on when the clients have already gotten to their worst point, you're just trying to keep them alive almost when uh, it seems like a lot of what you're doing is trying to prevent it, like living a better lifestyle and figuring out what to eat and taking care of your microbiomes. Um, similar to how we kind of look at, I guess, vaccines in some senses, like a lot of people that are healthy um, and uh, are, are fit and, and, and skinny and all these different things are less prone to having, you know, effects to COVID and all these different things. So, um, yeah, it, it, it seems like that was kind of the shift for you. Is that right? Exactly right, Sean. So what we're not doing is treating diseases or some aspect of a disease like high blood sugar. We're asking, or I'm asking, what are the factors in modern people that allow diseases like hypertension, coronary disease, uh, psoriasis, seborrhea, rheumatoid arthritis, depression, et cetera? What are, the, what are the situations, the phenomena that allow those conditions to emerge in the first place? And for a long, long list of conditions, modern conditions, it, they just go away. The diabetes goes away. 
the coronary disease risk goes away. The psoriasis, depression <laughs> goes away just by addressing. Now it's based on three things we're correcting. Um, one is diet. We're removing the things that humans simply are not adapted to consuming. We're told that humans have been consuming wheat and grains forever. No, they have not. It's a recent addition. And then agribusiness get, got in the picture and changed wheat and grains dramatically. Massive when was that change change. like that happened? In the 60s and 70s was the science. And then it became essentially ubiquitous in about the mid-1980s. So that every loaf of bread, bagel, baking mix, pizza crust, everything was made from what's called high yield semi-dwarf wheat. It's a strain of wheat that stands about 18 inches tall, not five feet tall, like we think of wheat, has a very thick stalk, large seeds, large seed head, and is biochemically and genetically extremely different from conventional Mm -hmm. wheat. Wheat has always been a problem for humans. Even the first humans who consumed wheat had all kinds of health problems from it. We know that with confidence, but it was when agribusiness changed wheat and then put it on all shelves in the 1980s. This is true essentially throughout the world. And that's because that strain of wheat was not created for evil purpose. It was created to increase yield per acre. It was good intentions to mind, Sean. It was meant to help feed the world. And the yield per acre did indeed go way up, fourfold, sixfold, eightfold. And it really helped feed people in Bangladesh and Somalia and places like that. But it also was very different from its predecessors, from traditional strains. And it has a whole long list of adverse effects on modern humans that we see just by looking around us. And and I did not appreciate until I had people take it out of their diet. And I saw health return uh, to a magnificent degree. In in terms of how we initially got introduced before uh, agriculture really stepped in, was that mainly because wheat was relatively cheap to grow compared to, let's say, meat uh, or like hunting for meat. And that's how humans initially got introduced, because even at that point, like in order to feed more people, it seems like the core was like you're, you're trying to feed as many people as, as possible for the lowest effort and cost. That's is that the same premise, basically, but agriculture, because of human population going up so high recently that we had to, you know, agriculture was introduced to even exponentially increase that and uh, affect the, 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 the nutrition deficiency of food. That's among the reasons. There's also reasons that people like it. They like the taste. There's also something in, in wheat, especially modern wheat. It's a protein called gliadin. So one of the things to, to it helps understand all these issues, Sean, is that wheat and grains are seeds of grasses. That's what they are. There's actually seeds of grasses. Well, humans just are not equipped. We don't have the digestive enzymes to break down the proteins in seeds of grasses. One of those proteins is the protein gliadin. And so, you know, if you ate a piece of pork or an egg, your body digests the proteins down to single amino acids. That's how you digest. That's how it becomes skin and bone and muscle. Well, when you eat the gliadin protein of wheat, you can't break it down to amino acids, you break it down to four or five amino acid long fragments or peptides. And these gliadin derived peptides have opioid properties. They cross into the brain and they stimulate appetite and cause addictive relationships with food. So that's why it it can be tough. I say to somebody, it's time to get rid of the wheat because you have high blood sugar, type two diabetes and autoimmune disease, coronary disease, small elder particles. <laughs> and they say, oh no, I can't, I can't. Because if I don't have wheat for a few hours, I'm going to get shaky. I'm going to start to have wow. panic attacks and opioid withdrawal syndrome. It lasts about three to five days. But when people do that, when they have the motivation and uh, fortitude to do that, they are magnificently freed of a huge long list of health problems. But you make a good point. Wheat, as well as corn, soy, and some other commoditized products feed the world. And it has been the reason why population has been allowed to expand to 7 billion people being fed on these commoditized monoculture type crops that put a lot of money in the the pockets of big agribusiness. But it's wrong, Sean. It's wrong. And we, while we may eat to survive another week, month, year, we pay a huge health price. So, uh, but you don't appreciate that till you take it out. 
Are there ways, just like the way we modify, genetically modify foods and add chemicals or, or proteins, <clears throat> enzymes, um, is there ways that we can remove that from wheat such that people can enjoy the taste, which is why most people eat pizza or bread, but also not be um, affected by that because of the you know, lack of compatibility of how humans digest? So that has sparked a return to traditional strains of wheat, like einkorn, emmer, spelt, etc. But here's another question that kind of casts light on this. What happened to the first humans 10,000 plus years ago in the Middle East who consumed einkorn wheat? So einkorn wheat is the great ancestor of modern wheat. It's a 14 chromosome plant. By the way, modern wheat is a 42 chromosome plant. In other words, it's completely different, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm in the US, I have 46 chromosomes. You're in Portugal, you've got 46 chromosomes. If we took somebody from India, they have 46 chromosomes. If we took a pygmy from Central Africa, they have 46 chromosomes. <laughs> but modern wheat, 42 chromosomes, ancestor of wheat, 14 chromosomes. It's a completely different creature. Mm. Well, what happened to the first humans in the Middle East who consumed wild growing wheat, einkorn wheat, not, not farmed, but wild? Well, they, they isolated the seed, they dried it in the sun, they ground it with stones, and then they uh, added hot water in a, in a stone bowl over a fire and had a porridge. And what happened to those people? They, so here's something a lot of people don't know. Before the introduction of wheat and grains into the human diet, the anthropologists know this with confidence, tooth decay, tooth decay, Sean, was almost unknown. There was no tooth decay, very little, almost no tooth loss, tooth abscess, misalignment. One to 3% of all teeth recovered back then showed any kind of evidence of damage or decay. And at a time, at a time, Sean, when there was no toothbrushes, no right. toothpaste, no fluoride toothpaste, no dental flaws, no dentists, right? when but there's this? almost perfect dental health. When wheat and grains were added, and this, by the way, is due to the amylopectin A car carbohydrate of wheat and grains. So when primitive humans 10,000 years ago added wheat and grains, tooth decay exploded. 16 to 49% of all teeth recovered showed decay, tooth loss, abscess formation, tooth misalignment. There was all, so in other words, it's a vivid illustration of destructive effects of you eat the wheat, yeah, to survive, but you have all kinds of problems, including dental health, because the dental record is much better preserved. There's, there's no fossilized livers, right, <laughs> or intestines. Yeah, but when was that also, time when the tooth decay was such a lower percentage when wheat was also different? Like what, what roughly what range of years was that period of time? About 10,000 years ago in the Middle East. Now, ago. that same pattern was seen in the uh, Central America, Mesoamerica, between 4,000 and 8,000 years ago, in this case with consumption of maize, corn, the mutated uh, uh, plant that came from the teosinte plant with a mutated seed head that, that we call a cob now, a corn cob. Right. So that same thing, an explosion tooth decay. And you see that today, by the way, in some of the indigenous populations. Uh, this is true in Central America, Southeast US, Southwest US, it's true for the Maori, New Zealand, uh, the New Guineans in the highlands. It's true for uh, the Hadza in Tanzania, the Maasai in Kenya. The, um, uh, uh, in other words, numerous populations unaccustomed to eating wheat, grains, and sugar uh, develop explosive tooth decay and diabetes and obesity, by the way. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's written in the, in the, in the uh, fossil record. There's also, by the way, a doubling of knee arthritis when you consume grains. And there's also the appearance of deficiencies. You know, we're often told you must eat grains for, for vitamins and, and fiber. That is a complete fiction. In fact, numerous deficiencies develop when you consume grains. And that, the reason for that is yet another component called phytates. You can't digest them, but they bind all positively charged minerals in your gut calcium, magnesium, manganese, uh, iron, zinc, and you poop it out in the toilet. 
So if you had a sandwich or a slice of pizza and you got some, let's say, magnesium or calcium with it, you don't absorb it because it's passed out in the toilet. So one of the great mm. causes, for instance, of iron deficiency anemia, oddly more so in females, not quite clear why that's true, less so in males. But ladies can have very severe anemia uh, measured by hemoglobin. Normal hemoglobin is around 12 or 14. Uh, these ladies walk around with hemoglobins of like six or seven. It makes them cold all the time and breathless and tired. They get iron uh, uh, supplements. They get iron injections. They get blood transfusions, bone marrow biopsies, and uh, nothing responds. And they're just, they feel awful. They get rid of wheat and hemoglobin is normal within two weeks. Hmm. But it's an illustration of just how powerful that phytate effect is. And people think, of, oh, gluten. No, no, no. There's a ton of things. Gluten is just one component. It's like the tar in cigarettes. Yeah, tar is bad, but there's a ton of other things in cigarettes <laughs> that make it make it harmful. Yeah, I don't know where this gluten-free um, thing really like spurred up all of a sudden in the last 10 years or so because yeah, it doesn't seem like anyone else is talking about the other factors that you're just mentioning in this interview. Um, I, and I, and I, I don't want to like encourage people not to follow this completely, but I just know a lot of people are still going to eat pizza or still going to eat bread once in a while. It's just not going to be for, it's, it's not, it's, there's no way that hundred percent of people are just going to completely stop breads so for the people that do want to occasionally enjoy wheat in any form. If they're at the grocery store, or if they're eating out, like what are, what are some of the ways they can still incorporate that once in a while, but still reduce the effects of, you know, the negative effects of that. Like, are there specific types of wheat or bread that they should buy at their grocery stores or um, anything that they should just look out for? Well, so you raise an important question. What is the, what's the effect of occasional consumption? Well, that raises a whole bunch of issues. One, when you are truly wheat and grain free, let's say you've done that for three months, let's just say you feel great, you've lost 37 pounds, your blood sugar is now normal, your blood pressure is normal, you're off blood pressure, all that stuff. You eat, say, you say, what the hell, right? You know, one little slice of pizza can't hurt. A little, a little yeah, slice of pizza. I've been doing so good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I want to myself. You get sick, you have diarrhea, bloating, cramps. If you got rid of something by going wheat free, like migraine headaches, eczema, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, it comes back and it can come back for weeks to months. Another thing that happens is uh, an effect I call, I ate one cookie and gained 30 pounds. <laughs> Meaning once you get re-exposed, glide and derived opioids, drive appetite, and some people can't turn it off. They have a real hard time. They say, you know, oh, I'll, I'll have just a little bite of that birthday cake. I'll exercise more tomorrow. I'll be really good, right? But they can't stop. And they, I've seen this happen numerous times. A month later, they're 20 to 30 pounds heavier and all the problems come back. Another thing to know, you know, my perspective on this, Sean, came from coronary disease, which a very serious disease, right? People die of this all the time. It's just in the world, it's the number one killer of men and women in the world. Yeah. Well, when you consume the amylopectin A of wheat and grains, that small LDL particle that is a very potent cause for heart attack and heart disease persists for a week. In other words, if I had fat, bacon, pork fat, whatever, it provokes large LDL particles that don't cause heart disease because the liver recognizes it and it's cleared within 24 hours. When you eat something with the amylopectin A of wheat or grains, it provokes formation of a small LDL particle. That particle has different surface conformation and the liver doesn't recognize it and doesn't clear it. So it goes around and around your circulation for about seven days. In other words, if you have an indulgence like that once a week, you've got cardiovascular risk, high cardiovascular risk, 52 weeks a year. And there's some other reasons why. In other words, if you look beneath the surface of, oh, I'm going to be gluten-free or that kind of, you start to see just how many critical problems there are. And you know right. what? Sadly, not, you're right. Not everybody's going to do this because especially it's, it's worse than the U.S. People say, I, I can't be bothered. Just give me my blood pressure medicines, my metformin, my glucophage, my uh, insulin injections. I'll just take the drugs. But now the thing to remember is when you have those diseases, 
of civilization. That's what the anthropologists call all the diseases that afflict modern people, the diseases of civilization that, by the way, do not affect people living, those indigenous populations, if they're unexposed to the Western diet. So some people don't want to do this. But, you know, so it's, this is not, we're not legislating <laughs> wheat and grain elimination. What we're saying is uh, the dietary guidelines are tragically wrong. They're set up based on flawed science, misinterpretations, and profit-making by big agribusiness. And so, but if you want the truth and you want to be freed of all the health problems that your doctor, by the way, has no, the doctor has no idea. The doctors are not experts. In a, in a perfect world, Sean, wouldn't it be wonderful if doctors were experts at nutrition and nutrients and the microbiome? They're not. They're sadly, helplessly ineffective and useless. You'll find this as you and your listeners get smarter and smarter about health and you see the doctor, you start to realize, you know what? I know more about health than he does. He doesn't know anything. He's got a prescription pad ready to write you pharmaceuticals and he knows how to schedule you for procedures. But if you said, hey doc, tell me about a diet that's really ideal for health and maybe address some of the nutrient problems we have in the modern, in modern world. And what about the condition of the modern microbiome that plays an important role in all aspects of it? Uh, don't waste my time. Did you consult Dr. Google again? There's nothing wrong with you. That's the stuff you get from my colleagues. And so sadly, I wish this wasn't true. The doctors have declared themselves ineffective and useless. Is that a lot of the reason um, from pharmaceuticals sponsoring the curriculum for doctors going to medical schools and you know, recommending these regimens? Absolutely. So when I first started practice many, many years ago, I, I grew up as a really poor kid uh, on the East Coast, uh, single mom, two sisters. We lived in a one bedroom house, <laughs> a dirt, dirt yard. We were poor. So I put myself through all those years of education, training, uh, stacked up a lot of loans and that kind of stuff. So when I got out and practicing and I had sexy ladies in miniskirts saying, Dr. Davis, do you want to go to dinner? Do you want to attend an all expense paid trip to Orlando? You, back then, you bet I do. <laughs> you know? They would lure you with sexy girls to go to these conferences. Oh, absolutely. Or guys wow. in three-piece suits. You know, it depends on who they're trying yes. to sell to. And by the way, that's for the medical device industry, which is far worse than the pharmaceutical industry. But you don't hear much about that. Um, but it's also true with the pharmaceuticals. They're very good. Sean, they're very, they're very good at playing on human nature. You know, if a, a young guy working hard is presented with sexy women uh, or ladies with sexy guy or whatever, whatever your preference is. It, it, you, you take the bait. At least I did in the beginning. And I started to realize this is stupid. This is corrupt. This is wrong. So I stopped doing it after a brief time, uh, but it became clear what they were trying to do. But you, you're exactly right. That is what drives practice behavior. It's not reading scientific studies. It's not weighing the evidence. It's talking to the sexy sales rep who's hawking their product. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry as a whole and their function, it is playing on human nature at its very core, which is it's a lot easier to pop a pill when you want, let's say, to go to sleep or to get rid of your fats or cholesterol than to lead an entire lifestyle from morning to day, watching what you eat, knowing what to buy and doing your own research. I mean, let's face it, it, it is a lot easier. And that's, that's why people like yourself is so critical to helping educate people around how to do this easier. Um, so yeah, this is, this is really great stuff. By the way, um, Sean, so yeah. what you're doing, you and other podcasters and other people who are in social media has become so important because I don't know if you've noticed this, your listeners have noticed this, people like me and you, can no longer get on major media, especially in the U.S. Because in the U.S., there's direct consumer drug advertising on TV and oh, other media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if yeah. you say, "Hey, you know all those drugs my the doctors are dispensing," they're not really necessary. If you take on a program of health, you can't say that on TV anymore. Right, because they're losing their advertisers. On, yep. It's 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 antagonizes the advertisers. This has been going on for about seven years now. Huh. Wow. Yeah. That's a revelation for sure. 
um, microbiomes and gut health. What is it about gut health that's so important? People talk about it being your second brain and you know the trillions of cells living in our guts. Uh, and how come it's been ignored until like, it seems like the recent decade, it's kind of made its uh, real presence, I feel, at least on my end, I'm sure you've known it for a while, uh, but it seems like a lot of my friends are now starting to talk about it. More people are talking about it as well. But talk to me kind of about the importance of it in terms of our general health. I got interested, Sean, because in my programs where we do wheat and grain elimination, and then we address common nutrient deficiencies like magnesium. You have to drink filtered water. You have to, else there's, uh, there's sewage and herbicide residues. So we have to supplement magnesium. Uh, vitamin D, because many of us live indoors, we wear clothes and we're outside. The, the common nutrient deficiencies, vitamin D, yeah. iodine, omega-3 fatty acids, magnesium. Can you just go back to the magnesium? That's the first time I'm hearing this. You're, you're saying when people are drinking tap water or, or, or um, just regular water, you're saying that so like extracts magnesium from our nutrients. So we have yeah, to take whether, supplements. Yeah. Whether your city filters the water or you filter it at home in a home filtration device, those devices are very good at removing all magnesium. So you and I are supposed to get up in the morning and go to the river or stream and drink water that's been flowing over rocks and minerals rich in magnesium and other minerals. Mm. Well, we can't do that. So we drink filtered water that has no magnesium. Well, that over many years causes bone thinning, osteoporosis, osteopenia. It allows metabolic distortions, higher blood pressure, higher blood sugar, insulin resistance, heart rhythm disorders, a whole long look because magnesium is so critical. And so because we're not getting it, we supplement magnesium to compensate. Likewise, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, where do you get omega-3 fatty acids? Consumption of brain. And fish and shellfish. Well, no one eats brain anymore. A little bit more in Europe, but not certainly not here. And brain consumption has become dangerous because of the emergence of prion diseases from farming practices like Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease and mad cow disease, those kinds of things. So we can't eat brain anymore. It's hard to eat fish in abundance because it's got mercury from coal burning. Can't eat shellfish all you want because it's got cadmium and cadmium accumulates. You don't clear it. So what about have, eggs? Uh, eggs has don't have those new eggs have other great things like vitamin D and beta carotene and healthy fat, healthy saturated fat. <laughs> but so we address those common nutrient deficiencies in addition to the diet, and you see wonderful things happen, uh, and people get rid of many diseases. But Sean, what I saw was not everybody goes a hundred percent all the way back to health. Maybe somebody says, I lost 73 pounds doing this, but I have 40 more to go and I'm stuck. Or my hemoglobin A1C, that's that measure of long-term blood sugar. I was a type two diabetic. It dropped from a terrible 12.3%. I was on my way to kidney failure and blindness. It's now 5.8%, much better, but not perfect, which is 5.0% or less, where you're completely absolved freed of all of long-term complications of diabetes. So I, I asked, well, what, what's, what's, persist, what's allowing this persistence of some of these? I looked to the microbiome. And as it happens, as you point out, for many years, the only way to assess the microbiome was to culture something. Take a poop sample, sputum, blood, anything, and culture it in a Petri dish or similar. Well, the emergence of uh, genetic methods, DNA sequencing and such, uh, uh, open. It's like opening a door to a dark room and you turn the light on. All of a sudden, oh, whoa, mm -hmm. you see that there are thousands of species we didn't know about because the great majority of species are called anaerobes. They die upon exposure to oxygen and don't grow in culture. So mm -hmm. now genetic sequencing has unmasked a whole universe of, of, of microbes that we didn't know about. And Couple that with the fact that more so in the U.S., antibiotics are handed out like candy. It's not uncommon by age 40, you've taken 30 courses of antibiotics. Well, the odd thing about all this is that common antibiotics like penicillin, amoxicillin, ampicillin, um, all those things, healthy microbes in the microbiome are very susceptible to those antibiotics. 
unhealthy, mostly stool microbes are not susceptible. So, and that's also true for many other factors like uh, synthetic sweeteners, like aspartame, preservatives. Preservatives are, are antibacterials. Well, the preservatives in your juice or other food kill bacteria in the food and in you. Even so the good the net, bacteria you're saying. Mm -hmm. mm. The net effect is all the things we're exposed to in modern life select for unhealthy microbes and kill off healthy microbes. Those healthy microbes, Sean, did things for us, did wonderful things for us. So my favorite microbe of all in the world <laughs> is Lactobacillus reuteri, named after Dr. Gerhard Reuter, the German microbiologist, when he discovered it in 1962. Well, back then, Sean, he, he said he could find it easily in breast milk and stool samples. And then as his 40-year career unfolded, he found it increasingly difficult. Modern surveys have shown that uh, only 4%, 4% of modern people have rotary anymore. Well, rotary is really important. So what happens when you restore lactobacillus rotary to the human intestinal microbiome? Incredible stuff happens, Sean. One of the things that happens is it takes up residence in the entire GI tract, upper and lower, which is unusual, sends a signal to your brain to release the hormone oxytocin, the hormone of love and empathy. So people say, oh, I like my partner better. I like my family better. I like my coworkers better. Mm. I, I like to talk to strangers. I introduced myself to strangers in line for coffee at Starbucks. Uh, I, I understand the opinions of other people better. But ladies love Rotary because the boost in oxytocin reduces wrinkles because there's an explosion in dermal collagen. Guys love it because it restores youthful muscle and strength. It's not uncommon to gain 8, 9, 10, 12 pounds of muscle in the first few uh, months after adding back Rotary, especially if you combine it with a little bit of strength training or other things to challenge your muscle. So you can add there's this back even, if you, even after you've lost it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. How do we do that? So um, one of the things we have to think about when we start to replace microbes is strain. This kind of sound kind of tedious and boring, but it's important. So uh, let's take E. coli. It's the best illustration I know of. So I've got E. coli. You and your listeners have E. coli in your guts. But what if you ate lettuce or other vegetable contaminated by cow manure and E. coli? you can die of E. coli. So same species, E. coli, Escherichia coli, different strain. So strain can sometimes make a life-death difference. So even though it sounds boring, <laughs> it, it can be very important. So I started first with, the str uh, with some strains from Sweden as a commercial product called BioGaia gastris, G-A-S-T-R-U-S. But I'm going to tell you, I think in this case, because I've made what we do is we make a yogurt out of it. I, I regret calling it yogurt. It looks and smells like yogurt. It's not yogurt. It just happens to look and smell like yogurt. But we make a yogurt out of it, but we can use completely different methods because we want really big counts of bacteria, like hundreds of billions. And we've performed flow cytometry. We do indeed get around 250 billion if you follow my recipes. So now I've made yogurt with Rotary with eight different strains. And Sean, I can tell you, per, now this is just personal anecdote. I've experienced all the effects with all eight strains. So I think in this case, despite the experience of E. coli, I believe that most Rotary do this. We're in the, we have a mouse trial ready to go, or I'm going to compare different strains of Rotary and their capacity to provoke oxytocin release and other factors. So I'll know in a few months, if there's a strain that's good at it, not so good at it, but so far. Uh, so, but if, if you want to be confident, I would start with the bio guy gastric strains. It's a commercial product, it's like 20 bucks, but it comes to the tablet in very low bacterial counts because it's made for infants mm -hmm. to reduce diarrhea and colic stuff. We don't really care that much about as adults. So what I, because the, the counts are real low, that's what my initial motivation was. I crushed 10 tablets and then made a yogurt out of it. The recipes are in my super gut book. They're in, um, 
in my drdavisinfinitehealth.com, drdavisinfinitehealth.com website, but it's real simple. We're going to from crush the tablets to start. I use organic half and half. I think where you are, they might call it something different, but it's a mix half and half of cream and whole milk, 18% fat. We want fat. It makes a much nicer end product. I add a fiber, a prebiotic fiber like inulin or raw potato starch to get bigger counts. And we let that ferment at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Celsius for 36 hours. Because rotorite double, you know, bacteria, Sean, don't have sex, right? They don't have male, female bacteria. They just double asexual reproduction. One becomes two, two becomes four, like that. Rotorite doubles every three hours. In a commercial yogurt making plant, they allow it to ferment for four hours. You got nothing using different microbes, of course. So we're going to ferment for 36 hours, 12 doublings. So you may recall the kid's riddle, which would you rather have a million dollars or a penny that doubles every day for 30 days? Kids always say, I'll take the million dollars, right? Not recognizing that the penny becomes five and a half million dollars. Yes, exactly. Compound interest. The same thing applies to bacteria that double. So we're going to allow 12 doublings. That's how we get about 250, 260 billion with a B counts per half cup serving. And that's when people consume it. You get the empathy. Ladies get smoother skin, restoration, youthful muscle, deep sleep with vivid dreams, increased libido, preservation of bone density, acceleration of healing. In other words, it's a complete transformation. By res- now, Sean, that's one microbe. That's one microbe in this hat. Now it's my favorite microbe, but it does, it gives you an extraordinary panel of benefits. And it's a supplement you're saying at the end of the day, it's a tablet that you consume and you have to get it at a, a, a pharmacy or a website somewhere that you can order online. There's no like natural foods that we can eat at every, and that everyone has access to at the grocery store to be able to get that specific microbe. Yeah, you have to actually buy the microbe from a, so the BioGaia, B-I-O-G-A-I-A, Gastrus, G-A-S-T-R-U-S, you get it on Amazon, and I don't know where, where you get it in Europe, you probably get it from Sweden, by the way, that's where it comes from. In the okay. U.S., there's a company called uh, Averitis, E-V-E-R-I-D-A-S, that is a distributor in the U.S., um, you can get it pretty easily, but as I mentioned, it's made for babies, so just like So the dose is very tiny. And if you took the tablets, I know people have done this, but they have to take like a hundred tablets a day. And it's ridiculous. You you can't do it. Because what we're doing when we do this yogurt is we're increasing the bacterial counts a thousand fold. No one wants to eat a thousand tablets, right? So it'd be expensive and you'd probably get sick. (laughs) So we start with the tablets. There's another product that I'm associated with called... um, LR Superfood, but it's only US. It's not sold. Now, if you want to take a chance, you can look for other s- strains of lactobacillus rotori, and they're out there. You can buy them. Uh, the one strain I would ask you not to use is the 30242. And I, these strain designations, Sean, are a pain, but I don't make this up. There's a strain yeah, designation called NC. Remember. It's called NCIMB 30242. I wouldn't use that one. It's very popular but it has some uh, properties that I don't think are very good. Yeah. Maybe it might be worth to just talk about general state of gut health. I know some people may have heard about gut health, but perhaps they don't know some of the steps they're taking uh, or some of the things that they should even avoid um, around just overall gut health before they get into the specialized microbes that they might be missing. Um, What are, number one, is there a way to measure your current state of gut health today that's easily accessible for everyone to know at least what is how healthy is your gut health? There's two ways. There's stool analyses, which is still in its infancy. The methods used, the numbers generated uh, vary. Different companies do it in different ways. We even did this. We submitted uh, four samples from the same bowel movement. One of my followers did this. One of my staff did this. Um, and submit it to four different testing. We got four different, wildly different results. So there's, there's still some problems. It can still shed mm. some light. 
So stool analysis can help. But the thing to bear in mind is the microbiome we're mostly interested is in the small bowel, not the colon. When you sit, look at a poop sample, that's a colon sample. So it does not reflect necessarily what's going on in the very important small intestine, 24 feet of small intestines. So, so there's some issues with stool analysis, but it can be helpful. The other thing you can do is test breath for various gases. So uh, do I have my device here? You can do this in a laboratory or you can do it with a home device. This is called uh, the AIR see. device, A-I-R-E, invented by Dr. Angus Short in Dublin, Ireland. Um, he did this, he made it for his wife. You blow into it, it registers hydrogen gas levels on your smartphone. Well, he thought it was, because his wife had irritable bowel syndrome, bloating, diarrhea, a gas, and was told to go on a low FODMAPS diet, a low fiber, low sugar diet to reduce her, her symptoms. Well, he saw how tough it was for her and she'd trip up and have a lot of gas and bloating. So he invents this device to tell her if she slipped up. Mm -hmm. And then he released it in 2018. I got a hold of it and I called him up. I said, Angus, that's not what this is. <laughs> I'm telling the inventor, Sean. <laughs> He's a good guy. He's my friend now. I, I, that's not what this is. This is a mapping device to tell you where in the human gastrointestinal tract microbes are living. But there's a specific way to do that. And that's so it, the, the instructions don't come with the device. It's in my super gut book. Uh, I lay out the rationale and how to use it. Now, Angus yeah. understands this now. They're changing direction, but they have some regulatory restraints on changing directions. Yeah. But it tells you if you have microbes in the upper GI tract. So uh, part of the consequence of all the nonsense we've been exposed to, like antibiotics and preservatives, all that stuff, is stool, mostly stool species, E. coli, Klebsiella, Citrobacter, have not only proliferated in the colon, they've ascended up to 24 feet of ileum, jejunum, duodenum, and stomach. That's called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. Uh, but when that happens, Sean, which I estimate conservatively, conservatively, one in three people have. I wouldn't have wow. told you that until I got the air device. And if you look back at all the evidence, yeah, in the US alone, way over a hundred million people have this. It's, it's, an epi insane. it's an epidemic of unprecedented proportions. It's bigger than the epidemics of diabetes, type of diabetes. Uh, what are like, you know, for, well, I guess first off, have you heard of a company called Viome or Viome, V-I-O-M-E? They, they, they say, you know, you, you pay $300 or $200 and then you can get the microbiome test. Like what is their method? I don't know how much you know about it because I, I certainly can't speak to it. Is their method that they're using legit? And is that something that can provide accurate results if you want to measure your own gut health? It is legitimate, but I wouldn't do it because it's non-quantitative. In other mm -hmm. words, if I said, if one of your listeners submits a poop sample and it comes back and they say, you have acromancia, which is a very important microbe to have, or you have fecalobacterium prosnitzii, another very important mi microbe, but they don't tell you how much you have. You need to know how much you have. Or what if they said something like you have clostridium perfringens? which is a very bad micro or clostridium difficile, very bad microbes. How much do you have? Because it's okay to have a little teensy weensy bit. It's not good to have proliferation because that, that was to make you very sick. So just to tell you, you've got it, but not tell you how much is a major flaw in that platform. So mm. each, each it gets kind of complicated, Sean. Each and every platform has its pluses and minuses because uh, you want a, a stool testing to tell you bacterial species and maybe strain not all tell you that some only tell you genus meaning they say something like this you have clostridium well is it clostridium difficile that causes a fatal enterocolitis or is it clostridium butyricum that's really great for health if if all i say is you have clostridia well, what the hell does that mean or what if i say you have lactobacillus which one Reuteri, gasseri Brevis, there's tons of them you need yeah. to know. So many testing platforms don't tell you that detail. You also want to know whether you have what are called archaea or methanogens, especially if you have constipation. You also want to know if you have fungi 
like candida albicans and other fungal species, because that can be explained, that can cause weight gain, depression, anxiety, sugar cravings. You want to have quantitative measures. How much of each do you have? A lot or a little? Yeah. Uh, and there's some other measures you can get in stool tests. So it varies from, from test platform to test plan. It gets kind of complicated in my super I guess we're gut disc- book. I, yeah, go ahead. In my super gut book, I do lay out uh, some of the pros and cons of some various testing measures. Yeah, I, I guess what I was going to say that it could help is if you don't have it, if they say that you don't have and you're, you're missing this healthy microbiome or this part, that's like black and white. So in, though, in that case, that's where... It, a test like that could be useful for, for, for a lot of people, I would imagine. Good point. Yes. Lacking yeah. something. But you'll have to know which ones to look for that are not there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's where your book comes in, <laughs> Dr. Davis. <laughs> um, so beyond the test, beyond the overall test that you have to do, are there just symptoms that we have? You mentioned irritable bowel syndrome as one of the things of unhealthy gut uh, or potential one of the options. Are there any things any troubles or, or sicknesses or illnesses that may be chronic that people are facing today that can say that can lead to, hey, this is probably a, 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 an issue with my gut, not some pill I have to take. And, and now it opens up the journey for them to, uh, to, to work on their gut health. You know, what's amazing is that virtually all common chronic modern diseases are either caused or worsened by a disruption of the microbiome. So disrupted microbiome contributes to high blood sugar, type two diabetes, coronary disease, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's disease, My Graves' God. disease, Hashimoto's, in other words, long, long, long. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's that important. It's that important. Yeah. I think uh, one way to look at this is what conditions, what phenomena, what symptoms suggest that very severe form of of disrupted microbiome, SIBO, where there's 30 feet, 24 feet of small bowel, four to five feet of colon, filled with proliferated, mostly stool species. So you you can imagine 30 feet of microbes, you know, they only live for a few hours. They don't live for decades, just a few hours. So trillions of microbes turning over rapidly in the human GI tract. When they die, a lot of their breakdown products in their cell walls uh, are released and then some get into your bloodstream. That's especially mm. true when they live in the small intestine because the small intestine has a much thinner single layer mucus barrier compared to the colon, which is a much thicker two layer mucus barrier. So 30 feet of microbes, leaky gut. That's what that's right. Okay. Uh, and the entry of breakdown products of bacteria called endotoxemia. But that's how, when, when people understand that, <clears throat> It explains how microbes in the GI tract can be experienced as depression or Alzheimer's dementia in the brain or as muscle and joint aches of fibromyalgia or restless leg syndrome or skin on the skin as psoriasis, seborrhea, eczema, and uh, rosacea. In other words, bacteria can export their effects to other parts of the body. But then you start to realize, wow, is there a disease not affected by the microbiome. Of course there are infectious diseases and injury and genetic diseases. Yeah, but all the diseases we're familiar with, high blood pressure, coronary disease, obesity, type two diabetes, autoimmune diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, these are all either initiated or worsened by the microbiome. So it's safe to say you shouldn't look for these negative symptoms to appear in your life to start improving your gut health. This is supposed to be something that everyone no matter where you live, who you are, how old you are, it should, it should be something that we primarily focus on improving at all times and optimizing that. That totally makes sense. A- absolutely, Sean, because I think sadly in a modern world, there's so many factors disrupting human microbiome. It could be something as benign, seemingly benign as the emulsifying agents in ice cream, the polysorbate 80, carrageenan and carboxymethylcellulose added to keep the, you've done this, right? You had ice cream, it was delicious, and you let it melt, then you refreeze it, and it separates. And it's ice and this awful solid stuff. And so they add emulsifiers to keep it mixed. Not because they're evil, they're ignorant, but, but they add it to keep it mixed. Well, that 
emulsifies the mucus barrier. Just like if you had a kitchen sink full of greasy dishes and you put a drop of dishwashing liquid, you see the oil disperse immediately. Mm. That's what those emulsifying agents do to your mucus barrier. And, and when you do that, it, your, your, your intestines are unprotected, at least for a while. And bacteria can both invade the intestinal wall and their breakdown products or gain, gain entry to the bloodstream. That's mm-hmm. just ice cream, Sean. <laughs> There's a lot of other problems. But you're right. It's a return to real, simple foods, to meats, fish, poultry. And of course, part of all this is rejecting conventional dietary guidelines like cut your fat. No, eat the fat, eat the skin. Save the bones and the tendons and ligaments. Make soups or broths out of them. Uh, eat the uh, organs whenever possible. Vegetables, nuts, seeds, real food, not the stuff that has preservatives, emulsifying agents, synthetic sweeteners. Return to, of course, this, this is much better. They do this much better in Europe than they do in the U.S. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, and, and I guess in, in addition to that, my kind of pay grade of gut health knowledge kind of goes, uh, kind of tip, it, it kind of tips off, uh, beyond eating fermented foods like sauerkraut or, or kimchi, which, which I've heard are really good for your gut health. I, I, I'm assuming it doesn't necessarily help you regain some of those missing microbes, like you mentioned, which is probably something that, that are like more specialized supplements that we have to get. Um, but I, I, I guess like so our sauerkraut and kimchi are those things that you recommend just in our daily uh, diets. And is there anything else that we can also eat that is going to be helping us with um, uh, our, our microbiomes? Excellent point, Sean, because that's probably the most important thing your listeners can do to rebuild a broken microbiome, get fermented foods. And you're right at the top of the list, kimchi. Kimchi is wonderful. Fermented sauerkraut, not, not the stuff you buy in the store that's in brine and vinegar, but actual fermented Mm. sauerkraut, fermented vegetables you make on your kitchen counter, kefirs, yogurts. Uh, There's all kinds of fermented foods. And you're exactly right. They have microbes like pentasaceous, like Pediococcus pentasaceus or Leuconostoc mesenteroides. So these are microbes that ferment foods. You ingest them. They don't take up residence for very long, mm. but their presence, it's not quite clear how this happens, but this is from the research of Justin and Erica Sonnenberg at Stanford. They did a very nice study where people who consume these fermented foods, it's not those microbes in the fermented food that take up residence but somehow they make you receptive to regaining lost microbes. It's not quite clear how are they there, but they're latent in small numbers, or are you somehow more receptive by touch and uh, uh, intimate contact with other humans or the environment? Nobody really knows what happens, but there's a bloom in healthy species when you consume uh, fermented foods several times per day. It, it, it is, mm. is a habit you have to get into several times per day. And it should be almost cost-free, because you can make these things on your kitchen counter. Like I, I ferment many times, sliced red onion, uh, cherry tomatoes, uh, some mushrooms, um, uh, in brine, of course, filtered water, no, I, no, no chlorine, non-iodized salt, no, nothing that's antimicrobial. And then let it sit on the counter for four or five days Yeah. at room temperature. You have to make it sure it's not contacting air. And there are various ways to do that. And, and you eat that and it has spectacular effects on health. Hmm. When you're talking about antimicrobial, um, I don't even know if I said that right or not, but the types of water that we drink, so no tap water, but what if we were to boil water that we get from tap water? It, does that remove the magnesium as well? Is that not as good versus buying mineral water from the grocery store? So it won't get rid of the magnesium. You, you actually want the magnesium. So, there, but there is no magnesium to start with in, in tap water. Oh, uh, so you can't. But there's okay. chlorine. Mm. So you you can boil for several hours and get rid of the chlorine. It's 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 really kind of a pain. Now where I am, they don't use chlorine. They use chloramine, which even if you boiled it for three days, Sean does not go away. Oh my God! So you yeah. just buy it at the grocery store? Like, how do you get water that's really good for you. You, you got to, you have to filter your water. 
it's a sad fact that you have to filter your water. There's too many contaminants in water. So there's a lack of nutrients like magnesium, but there's bad things in it also. There's radon, mm. there's uh, uh, industrial compounds, there's a long, long list. So you have to find uh, like a uh, reverse osmosis or activated charcoal type uh, filter. There's a bunch of these things now, but you have to filter your water. You okay. So you just filter it and then you take supplements of magnesium or, or you try to get it in food. So you just don't rely on the magnesium in, 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 in tap water. Okay. I, I wish I could say, Sean, go to the river and drink that. <laughs> you can't, right? You can't. Do yeah. Yeah. Not all of us can, unfortunately. Um, well, Dr. Davis, this, this has really been eye opening. Like I've, I thought I knew some stuff about gut health, but clearly there's a whole world that even experts like yourself are still discovering as more research and studies are showing up. So it seems like it's a really exciting time for people that are working on micro uh, microbiomes and gut health in general. Um, but one, one of the questions I have for you is when you're looking at, because I, I love to just ask experts to reflect back on their own personal routines and see how people can learn from other people's experiences. Uh, when you're looking at like from the moment you wake up to the moments that you go to bed, are there things that are kind of musts or non-negotiables for you that you tend to do that helps with gut health that you know you can think back and say, okay, I'm doing this because of my gut health. For example, filtering water could be one of them or supplements that you might take or stuff like that. Or can you kind of go through some of the things that are like really big impacts for you? Mm -hmm. So returning to natural foods in their original form, not cellophane wrap, microwavable, served to you through a drive through window, all that stuff, which is far worse in the U.S. that's over, overly industrialized. So return to just foods that aren't changed. Eggs, yes. avocados, real food. That's a big deal. Filtering your water, too many contaminants, adding back the nutrients that you don't get in modern life, magnesium because we have to filter our water. Vitamin D, big. And by the way, vitamin D has a major impact in the microbiome. Hmm. It affects the intestinal microbiome and something not often talked about. Uh, there's an epidemic of vaginal dysbiosis or vaginosis, disruption of the vaginal microbiome. And, uh, and that has major implications, not just for a woman's uh, uh, genital and sexual health, also causes premature delivery of a child. Premature delivery before 37 weeks is catastrophic, especially when you're into the 34, 35 weeks. That child is not only going to live on a ventilator and have multiple rounds of antibiotics and have increased risk for something called necrotizing enterocolitis, which is fatal 30% of the time in a baby, but that child is going to have learning impairments, behavioral problems, psychological problems for a lifetime. So the 11% of children born prematurely often triggered by vaginosis, vaginal dysbiosis. Well, no one's found the right probiotic regimen to correct that, vitamin D does. Isn't that incredible? Wow. It caused a complete shift in the composition of the vaginal microbiome. So vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids that we don't get because we don't eat brain and it's, and it's a, uh, dangerous to eat too much fish and shellfish. So we take fish oil. Well, omega-3 fatty acids that the entry of bacterial breakdown products into the bloodstream is facilitated by, uh, I'm just going to restate that. There's an enzyme lining intestinal wall called intestinal alkaline phosphatase. And it has the capacity to deactivate those bacterial breakdown products. Well, omega-3 fatty acids increase the activity of that deactivating enzyme. So it protects you from, and not complete, it's not, a, a complete solution, but it's a partial solution. It reduces endotoxemia from bacteria. Uh, so the diet address nutrients lacking in, in modern life and fermented foods, mm. the, kind of the cornerstone of everything people should be doing. It's different. It requires a little bit of education, a little bit of knowledge, but it's really not that tough, especially since you don't have gliadin derived opioid peptides driving appetite. And that's why most of us who do this eat twice a day, have one meal and then another meal, uh, one large, one small, and you're not tempted. You can walk right past the birthday cake, the pile of donuts at the office, 
all that stuff and not be tempted because you are back in control. So Sean, one of the sad things here is big food and big agribusiness know this. They're not stupid. They know that if they put foods that uh, are metabolized, the glide and drive opioid peptide appetite stimulants, they have control over your buying and eating habits. Mm. That's why in the 1980s and 90s, out of the blue, wheat and grain products appeared in all processed foods. They're not stupid. They, they saw this. Interesting. Um, just to go back, supplements in terms of omega-3, um, uh, um, uh, vid, vitamin D, and magnesium, you recommend supplements. Uh, obviously, like you, sun is probably the best vitamin D, but in terms of getting the additional ones, supplements are, are those three seems to be the, the mo more important ones in terms of gut health. That one and one more iodine. iodine so okay. people have forgotten that iodine deficiency was a major public health problem all throughout human history. You know, if you go to Rome or, or the Louvre in Paris and look at the statues from the Roman or Greek empires or any other, the ancient, you'll see some, some statues have goiters and large thyroid glands from lack of iodine. This was a huge problem. 20% uh, of the population had it, goiters. And if you had that, uh, you could actually die of congestive heart failure, um, serious problems. Mothers would deliver children with impaired intelligence until it was discovered in the 1920s that it was due to lack of iodine because all the iodines in the ocean. And if you live inland, there were pockets of populations in Europe, for instance, where the entire village uh, was populated by tiny people who had very low IQs and, and they were funny looking called Cretans. That it was true in the mountains of Spain and, and France and Germany because they had no iodine. They were too far away from the ocean to get iodine. Mm. So many of us have forgotten. This was a huge public health problem, yeah. but it went away with the introduction of iodized salt in the U.S. and some other methods in other parts of the world. Uh, and the, in the U.S., the FDA said, use more, this is in the 1920s, use more iodized salt. Keep your family goiter free. People listened and goiters disappeared. Overuse of salt, the FDA thought, led to high blood pressure and other problems with salt uh, and say, quit yeah. using the salt, even though they told <laughs> us to do that. What they misinterpreted, Sean, was their dietary advice. Cut fat, eat more grains, causes insulin resistance, which causes sodium retention. The problem was not the salt. The problem was the diet, low in fat, rich in grains. So let's do the opposite. Let's not worry about salt. Use the salt you want. Get the salt with iodine, without iodine. As long as you get your iodine from someplace, don't cut your fat, eat all the fat you want, don't eat grains. And when people do this, by the way, in the first week or so, you actually have to hydrate X more than usual and salt your food and water. Because if you don't, you can pass out. That's what that happened in the early days when I was doing this because you're no longer retaining sodium. Oh, and yeah. you have to, people who have high blood pressure have to actually anticipate this. They have to either reduce or stop some of the blood pressure medications, which you should do with your doctor's supervision because some drugs can't just be stopped. And hopefully you have to find a doctor who understands because a lot of doctors say, oh, once you're on those drugs, you, you can't get off. Yeah, you can. <laughs> and it's easy. But you need a doctor who's smarter than the average bear. Yeah. yeah but yeah. Uh, all that goes away. Sodium retention goes away. And so you can see what we're doing, Sean, rewriting all the rules of health. And because we're you and I are not interested in selling drugs. We're interested in health. That's what your listeners are interested in. Mm -hmm. But sadly, the message of health, the insight, understanding of health typically does not come from the doctor, doesn't come from the pharmaceutical industry, doesn't come from the hospital. It comes from you, comes from me, comes from people talking, sharing the evidence, thinking about it, and, and putting it into practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great to hear from someone like yourself that learned the traditional rules and have gone through the whole process for many decades. And now you're stepping out instead of the uh, audience and educating people in terms of how to rewrite the rules. So there's credibility because you've seen both sides. And I think that's why people listen to you and people will take your advice seriously. Um, well, Dr. Davis, this has been such a fascinating conversation. Obviously, I want people to check out many of your books. Number one, New York Times seller, the, the Wheat Belly and, and the cookbooks that you have, uh, your latest book, Super Gut, uh, which, which is 
talking about the four week plan to restore your gut health. Um, where else can people learn more about you? So in addition to the books, uh, my Dr. Davis, infinite health.com, Dr. Davis, infinite health.com is kind of the central place. Now I've, I've changed a lot of the sites I had and that contains my blog. Now it contains a membership site where, uh, typically once a week I do a two way zoom me and like eight to a hundred people. And we talk about all these kinds of things. I say, I made the yogurt didn't come out right. What did I do wrong? <laughs> that kind of stuff. Or I took a, a, a form of vitamin D and didn't generate a rise in my blood level. All the little details, but it's support. Because it, my, my, my interest is the same as your interest. And that is, let's help people get healthy because it's not coming from the healthcare system. Hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for coming on. All the links below, guys, you guys can see on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you may be listening to this. And thank you so much for tuning in.